Southwestern Uganda could be Africa's own Garden of Eden. In these valleys, the people rely on the land to fill their stomachs and the church to nourish their souls. Faith in God is one of life's few certainties. It's also the scene of a crime as old as the Bible itself, the collision of faith and murder. The slaughter of hundreds of followers of a devout religious cult led by Joseph Kibwetere, who preached the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God and a millennium Armageddon. But nobody knows how so many people could have been killed with not a single person raising the alarm. How do you systematically exterminate a thousand people un unnoticed unless you are really organized? There were frightening people. There was a religion of fear. And see, people can confuse fear with faith. <laughs> and they used to call themselves holy, holy people. Hmm? Keeping ten commandments. What about the fifth one? Thou shalt not kill. Joseph Kibwetere's compound is abandoned now to the ghosts of his victims, the 330 people who perished here when they were herded into a church and incinerated. Inside the classrooms, the lists of children who studied here and died here. He told his followers this place would be their Ark of Salvation and used radio broadcasts to attract converts drawn by his promises of heaven, but only for those faithful to God's commandments. A devout Catholic, Joseph Kibwetere, was a respected community leader until he was drawn away from the church and into the cult. The well, people were all like charcoals. They were all black. They were, were already burnt. Father Narcissus Begumisa is a shepherd who has lost his flock, the parish priest in the little village of Kanungu. Two years ago, he came to the compound to tell the cult leaders to stop what they were doing. Did you speak to Joseph Chibuatere? Yes. And what did you say to him? He said he, he got the, the vision from Our Lady. He, was, he said he, Our Lady wanted him to come this way with his companions to stay. This, he regarded this place as a horror, place chosen by Our Lady. That was in 1998. And after that, the cult was left alone, until recently, when strange things started happening. On 14th, all members of that cult who were present paid their taxes, even arias. They even paid any debt they had with anybody and made good all mishaps that had happened between them and the local community. It seems certain that by then the deception was complete and the cult leaders were ready to execute the final phase of their tragic plan. Joseph Kibutera and his followers lived an orderly but isolated lifestyle here in this compound, so it was easy to believe the inferno was an act of religious fanaticism. But when police came here and found six bodies stuffed inside this deep hole, they began to suspect something far more sinister. The six corpses found buried under a building in the compound was just the beginning. A week later, another 150 in a mass grave nearby, then 81, then 130. By the end of it all, 720 bodies had been recovered. 
with more properties belonging to the cult still to be excavated, no one knows how many more there may be. The search for answers began in the bush, about 20 minutes walk from the cult's compound in Kanungu, at the home of Concleo Benunga and his 17-year-old son Peter. Concleo's family is both blessed and cursed. Peter is the sole survivor of the cult fire. His wife and six relatives perished. That Peter is alive, a twist of fate, or perhaps as he believes, the hand of God. The cult members had been fasting and Peter was hungry. So on the morning of the fire, he returned to his father's house to get something to eat, a decision that would save his life. What did you see when you went back there? Still, it didn't take long for the police to catch up with Peter. He was quickly arrested and taken away for questioning. His eyewitness testimony has placed two cult leaders at the compound on the night before the fire, but not Joseph Kibwetere. That's the key to solving the case. Police don't even know if they should be searching for him because they're unsure if he's dead or alive. We believe there was a systematic extermination of followers. And we believe this was after the prophecy failed to materialize because according to them, the world was supposed to end on 31st December 1999. It did not happen. But before that, they had told the members to sell their property and hand the proceeds to the head. I think the people started dying because they started asking questions about their property when the end of the world didn't come on the 31st of December 1999. So they continued extending the deadline, saying, no, the world will end tomorrow because there was an error somewhere in the counting of the days. They said, no, the world will end in March, until when they agreed it would end on 17th March. Eric Naigambi is the public face of the Ugandan police, which is confronting an investigation that would stretch the resources of the FBI or Scotland Yard. It's a case that's filled with blind alleys and false leads. This is a list of people which was found in the ruins after the fire. Those people who feel that their people may have perished in the fire and appeared in the, on this list to move forward and inform the police. How much did the police really know about Joseph Kibutere, his cult, and the killings they committed? There were some intelligence reports about that sect, but they didn't have inside information as to what was going on. They were simply watching it as a community of worshippers. They didn't know it as a, a criminal gang, as it has turned out to be. But how did elderly priests manage to slaughter so many people and bury them in graves 20 feet deep? No one seems to know. I don't think it's easy to kill a person. It should be hard work because the person is fighting for his life. There should be screams. There should be calls for help. We are finding these people with smashed heads. How was it being done? Were they being exterminated from some point and then brought to, to be buried? 
three times a week, twice on a Sunday, Teresa Kibwatera comes to the church that she built with her husband as a monument to their faith and their God. But Joseph stopped coming to church with her in 1995. Now she prays alone and wonders how the man she married could have become a monster. So this is Joseph here. Yes. What sort of life did you think you were going to live together on your wedding day? <laughs> we, we thought of to be we thought of that life to be a very happy one. And it's what it was before he went with those people. It was a happy one, a very cheerful, happy and lovable to our children. Things went wrong when they met a former prostitute, Credonia Murinde, who claimed to have had a vision of Mary, who told her to move in with Joseph and help spread his message. They stayed with me for about two years. I found that they, they were not good to live with them. Hmm? Credonia was always cruel. Hmm? <laughs> She was always cruel. She was not happy at all. She never smiled even. Hmm? She was cruel. How did your husband change from the man you married? Mm -hmm. You see, by that time, he disliked me somehow. Because whatever Kedonia would say that I have done so, such and such, or I'm a bad woman, and he agreed. Besides her devotion, there are some things Teresa is sure of that her husband is dead, that what happened was not his fault, and that judgment is coming. I'm not the judge, but for, for the action they did, or he did, I'm sure he's not in heaven. Mm -hmm. For that, I, I don't know. Only God knows. God is the only judge for what they did. But where do you think he would be? Mm -hmm. Maybe in here. The fifth commandment says, thou shalt not kill even one person. Hmm? Imagine so many people whose life have been destroyed because of Credonia, my husband, and those priests. So, as a person, I think they can't go to heaven. I don't know, but only God knows. The best explanation for the phenomenal growth of cults and fringe religions in Uganda comes from the church itself. Prophets, healers, cults and other religious splinter groups have proliferated throughout Uganda's hard years. They want to have a God who would answer their prayers immediately and they would like somebody who can give a straight answer. They want a God who can give a straight answer. And this man claims to be just the person to give straight answers, a real live prophet. Do you? communicate directly with God? Ah, so get up to Nekatonda, Wabula Amani, Amani, Gugasobolo Tus, Amani, Gigantus, the Dobos, Atel Amani, Gigansi, the Zechigambo. The Prophet Samedu's church is located in a back street of Kampala. He stays here with a small band of followers. His self-proclaimed ability to communicate with saints ensures that his waiting room is always occupied with people like Scholastica Nabukira. Scholastica is a believer held by an unshakable faith in the prophet's powers. She still goes to church, but says she doesn't get the results that she gets when she comes here. And when you go there, they don't pray for you. For me, I was a, I'm a Catholic even by now. But don't, they don't pray for you. You go there all together, you play the Mass, then you go back. You attend the Mass, then you go back at home. Even the problems stay there. You see? So if somebody comes along and says, well, this is a God will, you do this, 
and this is what will come out. That kind of, of thinking is very dangerous, especially in the faith. The story of Jamila Nansisi is typical of the influence of people like the Prophet Samedu. She was brought to him when she was ill, but through prayer, Jamila says the Prophet has cured her. Now she lives in his compound, cooking the Prophet's meals and washing his robes. I gave, I gave up school and, and I left my parents. I was staying with my parents, but I left them and I decided to, go, to come and serve God. My father is worried. He thinks that I'm in bad things, things, things which are not in God. But I told him that I'm, I'm, I'm a person of God and I should serve God. In Uganda, people will always believe there is a God. Be it the God of Father Narcissus, the God of Joseph Kibwetere, or the God of the Prophet Samedu. The destruction of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God was not a mass suicide of believers, but murder most foul. Joseph Kibwetere's followers were led there because they believed in his message but they did not go to their deaths willingly and for their devotion have paid the highest possible price.